Hello and welcome to Travel Trails. In ancient times, people worshipped idols by bowing down to them. Even today, in some religions, people bow to idols. Some people will bow down to their royalty, or in some cultures, people bow as they greet each other. Yeah, we might bow to someone out of respect, such as an elder, but physically bowing isn't really a common thing in our country. That's for physically bowing. But you know what? Many of us still bow down to our attitudes and desires. How does that happen? Well, our guest is going to explain that. Our old friend Mervyn Chichu joins us today. Mervyn is a pastor and a chief from Moose Factory, Ontario. Let's join Mervyn as he uses Daniel chapter 3 to discuss seven things we shouldn't bow down to. I'm glad you're able to tune in today to Tribal Trails. I have a message I want to share with, especially the young people, but I think it applies to all of us. Daniel chapter 3, it's the story of a wicked king named King Nebuchadnezzar who uh, erected this golden statue, it says, that was 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. So that people from all that came together could see this big, tall statue that he had set up. And he issued a law that everyone must bow down to this idol that he had made. And when the trumpet sounded, they were, when the musical instruments started to play, they were asked to bow to the ground and worship the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And so the time, the day came when the music started to play, the trumpet started to blow, and, and people started bowing down. And uh, there was three young Jewish boys that day in the audience. And they were taught to worship only God and to bow only to the God of heaven and earth. And word went to the king that there were these three Jewish boys who did not bow. And there was... Uh, a uh, stipulation that was made that if you did not bow, you would be thrown into a fiery furnace. And when King Nebuchadnezzar was told that the three Jewish boys did not bow down, he asked that they be brought into his presence. And then he uh, confronted them. He got so angry, it says, that he ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? He said, I'm going to give you one more chance. If you bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments, all will be well. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. What god will be able to rescue you from that my power then? I like their response, and I want to read it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, your majesty can be assured that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. And it says, Nebuchadnezzar became so angry and furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that even his face became distorted with rage. And he ordered that this furnace be turned up even seven times hotter. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into that burning furnace. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the Bible says, the flames leaped out and killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego securely tied fell down into the roaring flames. But something amazing happened. But suddenly, the Bible says, as he was watching Nebuchadnezzar, as he was watching, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, they said, we in did indeed, your majesty. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire. They aren't even hurt by the flames, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. And you know, uh, 
God was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then it goes on to say that Nebuchadnezzar, it says, began because of what the miracle that they saw that God protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any other except their own God. Therefore, I make this decree of any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be crushed into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. I want to challenge you young people today. All and on television and even everywhere we turn, we're bombarded with uh, temptations to bow to what is being offered. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made the king mad when they stood for the Lord. His face was red when he said, throw them into the fire. So they tied their hands and they tied their feet. They threw them on into the burning heat. But the Lord was there and he said, boys, everything's cool. challenge you today not to bow to seven things that you're often confronted with. The first one is drugs and alcohol. I, would, I want to challenge you, do not bow to drugs and alcohol. And what makes it even harder at times is it's often our, our, our closest friends that are inviting us to participate in drinking and taking drugs. And it's so hard to say no to your best friends. I mean, you just need to turn on the television. You just need to look in our communities, our First Nations community, to see 
the damage that alcohol and drugs have done to people, how it's torn their lives apart, torn their families apart, are tearing our communities apart. My challenge to you today is to say no, don't bow to drugs and alcohol. A guy by the name of Dr. Gabor Mate says that underneath all addiction is pain. And to numb that pain, we turn to alcohol and drugs. I want to challenge you to get help for your pain. Go get counseling. Talk to a pastor. Talk to a close friend. Someone who can help you deal with the pain that's in your life so you don't have to turn to alcohol and drugs. Say no to drugs and alcohol. The second thing I want to challenge you not to bow to is sexual sins. I want to say, first off, that God created sex. Gave us mankind as a beautiful gift. But according to the scripture, to, between, to be used within the bonds, the bounds of marriage between husband and wife. Sex between husband and wife is a very beautiful, powerful thing. I want to challenge you today not to bow to sex outside of marriage. To wait for that person that God has given you or will give you. Until that right person comes who you fall in love with. Where there's going to be trust, commitment and faithfulness and love. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18 says, uh, and I want to read that verse. Apostle Paul talking to the church at Corinth, he tells them to flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. It says there to flee. I like that. He says run away from it. I mean, even television, everywhere else, we're bombarded with sex. It says flee sexual immorality. That's what the Bible calls it. It's a sexual sin outside of marriage. Don't participate in it. Wait until you're married. And God will bless you for that. It says when you partake in sexual sin, it's a sin against your own, your own body. We've uh, heard of sexually transmitted diseases, AIDS as a result of sex outside of marriage. I challenge you today to wait for that white person, to pray that God would lead you to the person that you should be spend the rest of your life with. God is able to provide. God is able to do that. He knows your needs. He knows you long for love and intimacy. God is able to lead you to that right person whom you could find out with for the rest of your life. Say no to sexual sins. Number three, say no to negative peer pressure. Don't bow to negative peer pressure. Again here, it's so difficult when the peer pressure is coming from our closest friends or our family those we love, those we spend time with. But I want you to be, to realize that it's okay to say no. That it's okay to stand alone and be different. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Three out of, I don't know how many people were there that day, probably thousands. They were willing to say no in front of everyone. They were willing to stand alone. They did not bow to negative peer pressure. They were willing to stand alone. I remember hearing the story of this, uh, this test that they were doing of these 10 young people that were lined up in, in the front of the room. Nine of them knew what was going on. One didn't know. And uh, the whole point of that is that this individual was going to ask a question. And he, he was going to say, how many of you believe this to be the right answer? Nine of them would put up their hand even though it was the wrong answer. And they were testing out this one individual, one young person. So anyway, the day came when they did the test and they said, how many of you believe that this is the right answer? Nine of them just enthusiastically put up their hands like they just knew the answer. And, and this guy that was standing there knew it wasn't the right answer, but he looked over and saw a lot of his friends with their hands up. But inside he was wrestling because he knew it wasn't right. He knew it wasn't the wrong answer. But you know what that young person ended up doing, even though he knew it was the wrong answer? He slowly slipped up his hand. And then later on, they discussed the issue of uh, peer pressure. Peer pressure is hard. 
when you, especially those who are closest to you are telling you, come on, do this. Let's go participate in this. I want to challenge you to be willing to stand alone at times in your life. Even if the majority is uh, saying yes, I challenge you to say no to the negative things in your life. Number four, I challenge you not to bow to aimlessness, aimlessness or not having purpose in your life. That's really a big struggle for a lot of our young people. When you don't have purpose in your life, then you have no passion, no motivation, no direction, as Andy Stanley says. We don't really know where we're going, so we're just kind of lost and wandering around in our communities. You need to have purpose in your life. You need to know what you should be, what you should be doing in your life. You should know the direction you should go. Mom and dads are able to help you with that. Your teachers are able to help you with that. The pastors are able to help you with that. And most importantly, God has a purpose for your life. He has a plan for your life. He knows what direction your life should take. And that's why I want to challenge you to have purpose in your life, to turn to God, to find out what your purpose, why you're here on this earth, what your purpose is, what work that you have been given to do to impact others in this life. You know, my son Jonathan made the National Hockey League. He has a powerful story of having purpose in his life. He was sitting down in his classroom in grade 7, 1992, as a 12-year-old boy in Moose Factory, Ontario. He wrote an essay, What I Want to Be in 2002. Looking ahead, uh, he wrote down, I want to play in the National Hockey League. I want to play for the San Jose Sharks. And then he wrote a whole bunch of other stuff. You know what that was, folks? When I look back at it, it's having a vision for your life. Vision is painting that picture in your mind. This is what I want to be. Not only want to be, but this is what I should be. And then really pursuing that vision, that purpose. And that's what Jonathan did from that day forward. He gave everything he had to really fulfill that vision that he had in his life. The purpose that he was called to do. Powerful thing. You know, he got drafted in 1998 as an 18-year-old. Didn't make the hockey San Jose Sharks that year. He got drafted by the Sharks, which was amazing because that's a team he wanted to play for, he said, when he was 12 years old. He went back to the training camp, 99, 2000, 2001. For four years, he went and tried to make the San Jose Sharks, to make his dream come true. And each year, he didn't make it. Those were difficult times. Those were hard to be told that you did not make the team this year. His dreams were shattered. But Jonathan didn't give up. He just kept pressing, kept working harder. Then he went back in 2002. You remember his essay? I want to play in the National Hockey League in 2000. I want to play for the San Jose. You know what, folks? He went back, and in 2002, he made the San Jose Sharks. You need to have vision. You need to have purpose in your life. Fifthly, say no, or don't bow to violence or bullying. Say no. There's a lot of violence in our communities. Again, violence comes from the anger that's within us. We've been hurt. We're in pain. So we lash out at everybody else in violence and in bullying. We don't feel good about ourselves. That's really what bullying is too. The person who is the bully doesn't feel good about themselves because of everything that has happened in their lives. So they try to bring everybody down. They try to hurt everybody else. Deal with that hurt. Deal with that pain. Say no to violence. Say no to bullying. Don't hurt others. God calls us to love people, to be gentle with each other, to care about one another. Don't bow to violence and bullying. The sixth thing is lies. Don't bow to believing lies about yourself. Psalm 51, verse 6 says that God desires truth in the inward parts. He wants us to look at ourselves in truth, not to believe lies about ourselves. A lot of our lives come from the experiences, especially the negative experiences that we've had in life. They come from good experiences. Good experiences give us the truth. When somebody says to you as a child, oh, you're a very good-looking or beautiful girl or beautiful boy, that gives us a good self-image. 
But when somebody slaps you in the head or somebody says negative things about you, you or you've got big ears or a big nose, then we begin to believe those lies and we develop a negative self-image. And we, start, we live our, the rest of our lives believing these lies. You know, there were three lies that I uncovered in my counseling. There were, I can do it, I can do it right, and everyone can do things better than me. I believed those lies for years, and it really hindered my life. I didn't move on as faster as I could in my life than I should have. But you know what I did? One day I asked God to forgive me for believing those lies. Because God doesn't say that about me. He says, I can do it. You can do it right. And then you can, I can do it just as good as anybody else, the things that he has called me to do. I don't know what lies you believe in your life today. Maybe you feel like you're no good, you're ugly, you're damaged goods. Many, many lies you can believe. I want to challenge you today to deal with those lies, to ask God to forgive you for believing those lies and start believing what he says about you in his book, the Bible, where he says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that he loves you and that he cares about you, that he created you male or female, and he said it's very, very good. I want to tell you you're a beautiful person today. But sometimes these lies come in our way that, that blind us from really believing what God says about us. Don't bow to the lies in your life. And lastly, I want to challenge you today not to bow to suicide. Say no to suicide. I want to tell you that things will be okay even though they don't seem like they're okay today. I want to tell you that things will get better. That even if you failed and you feel horrible about it, I want to tell you that that too can be dealt with. That can be forgiven. That can be cleansed. Problems that you have can be solved. They can be helped. You can get help for them. Maybe you experience a broken relationship, and that's very painful when you're a young person to break up with your girlfriend or your, your boyfriend. It's a very, very painful experience. But I want to tell you that you can heal from that. That you will be okay. And a lot of other problems and pains that we have gone through, maybe sexual abuse in your childhood. Maybe you grew up in an alcoholic home. Maybe you experienced bullying, violence, and you feel like you're just wounded and hurting today. And you feel like taking your own life. I want to challenge you today, don't, don't bow to a suicide. Life can become better. You know, Jesus said in his word, John 10.10, 10, the thief comes but to steal and to kill and to destroy. We've experienced being robbed and stolen from and destroyed. We've, we've experienced that. But then the second part of that verse is what I want to share is Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it to the full. Maybe because of all your woundedness, your hurt and your pain, you don't feel whole, you feel broken. I want to tell you today that Jesus Christ came that you might have life and that you might have it to the full. What a wonderful offer he offers you and I today. You know, for me, I was an angry, hurting and a bitter teenager. And you know what? I accept, invited Jesus Christ into my life one day as a 16-year-old. I asked him to forgive me of all the sins that I committed in his life. And then I invited him personally to come into my life. You know, uh, and Jesus did come in. He saved me. He rescued me. He changed my life. I was angry, bitter, and hurting too. But Jesus made a difference in my life. And today I experience life to the full. You know, as I continue to walk with him, and I don't say this with pride. I say this because of what that God that did that to my life. That, you know, I eventually met the love of my life. We got married. And this year we're going to be celebrating our 40th anniversary. I have an awesome marriage. I love my marriage. I love my wife. I have three beautiful children. Jonathan, I talked to you about a bit today. I have Carrie, my daughter Carrie, my son Jordan. They're all happily married and finding their purpose in life. And to me, as my wife and I as parents, that makes us feel good. I, I do ministry. I'm a pastor. I'm president of Rising Above Ministries, a counseling agency. My wife and I just obtained our master's in counseling. I've pastored churches. I speak all over the place. I just enjoy my life. I've played sports all my life. I've, 
I've had a good life. And I want to tell you, it's all because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. So I challenge you today to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Say no. And you know what? They were richly rewarded. And that's what I want to close with today also. In the Bible that I read, the story that I read, when they were thrown into that fiery furnace, there were, there were three of them that were thrown in, but they saw a four per, fourth person there who was the Son of God. I want to tell you, if you're struggling today, if you're standing alone and even everybody else says no, I want to tell you Jesus will be with you like he was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you know what will begin to happen? Other people around you will begin to look at your life and like Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that has happened to me too, even as a 16-year-old when I said no to all my friends, I don't want to live like this anymore. Eventually they came back and said, we like the way you're living. We want that life too. There'll be praise that will come out of you. Person of Christ, praise, then protection. Nebuchadnezzar said to the people, if anybody says a word, Against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm going to deal with them, is basically what he said. God is able to protect you, and he's done that many times. And then he'll promote you. Your life will just get better and better. Proverbs kind of talks about that in 4, verse 23. That, uh, that, uh, that our, our life is like the shining light that gets brighter and brighter unto that. Life gets better for a Christian as you walk with God. Thanks to Muru for sharing with us today. Do you or a loved one bow down to any of the seven things Merv talked about? Some of them are very serious and difficult matters, so please don't let them continue on. Contact Tribal Trails if you would like resources related to those issues. Most importantly, be in right relationship with Jesus Christ. Confess your sins and ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. The less you bow down to these seven idols, and the more you turn to Jesus, as Mervyn said, the better your life will be. God bless. Now sometimes it's hard to stand for Him. Oh, to be so easy to fall into sin. When all around you they bow to their idols of gold. Everything's cool.